everyone. Welcome to the Artist uh, Create Change Long Island Public Arts Festival, hosted by the Babylon Citizen Council on the Art. I am your moderator today, Jade Ward. I have a background in public art, community development, and consider myself a visual designer with a heavy focus on creating access for folks who don't have access to art. So, today's panel discussion, we're actually going to talk about the importance of public art in our communities. Public art has a unique power to inspire and connect us, turning everyday spaces into reflections of our shared identity and our dreams. Art is more than just a decoration. It's a catalyst for dialogue, a tool for social change, and a driver of economic vitality. We're very fortunate today to have a distinguished panel of experts who bring a wealth of experience and insight into how public art can truly make a difference. We have today, we have Georgia Lemire Tomzak, Ron Becker, Basel Seymour and Rachel Miller. But before we go into it, I'm going to let them all introduce themselves in more detail so you can know a little bit more about it before we dive into today's questions. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I'm the public programs manager at the Zoo Care Gallery, which is um, located on Stony Brook University's campus. So the University Park Gallery, um, basically we do contemporary art and all that stuff. And um, I have a background in, I have a master's in museum studies and working at various museums and science areas as an educator, so um, I will get more into that, but very much about art being public and for everyone, and yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Barbara, for the invitation and this wonderful event that uh, started today. I'm a Barbara member and a fine artist. I also do uh, murals both public and private settings, and love art. Hi, thank you, Baka, for having me tonight. Um, my name is Rachel Miller. I own a company called Spirit Ironworks. I'm um, a business owner, but also an artist and blacksmith. Um, we create art for artists. We also design and create our own public art. So we do a variety of both. Um, we work. We have the honor of working with Baca on a project um, in Wine Dance, and we've also done um, our metal fabrication for Jeff Koons as well. Good evening. Uh, first, thank you to Baca for including me. Um, I'm just here anyway because I work in this building. I'm the director of beautification. I'm the director of economic recovery for the town of Babylon, and most recently the deputy commissioner for parks. Recreation and Cultural Affairs. Do you have your name? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm the Salmore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for introducing yourself. So, to emphasize again, public art enriches our communities in countless ways. It beautifies our spaces, it fosters pride, it stimulates important conversations, and it addresses social and environmental challenges we see. It reflects who we are and what we stand for. So let's dive into our first segment, community engagement and public art. And my first question for the group is, can you define what public art means to you? Start with you. Just go down the line. If you want to send it out, just let me know. But this one, I would love to hear everybody's like input. Yeah, so um, something that I'll bring up that we emailed back and forth about when you said this, that you were like, what is public art? Or you said, that's just kind of like inherently what we've been talking about. And I was like, is it all art, public art? I think that's like the luxury of working at a university where our mission is to like embrace all students and incorporate, you know, um, learning with everything that um, we do. So, and I, I think it's also part of my kind of professional identity too. And just who I am as a person that I'm like, it should be for everyone and everyone should feel welcome and um, not just welcome, but like that they have shared authority or that are part of it um, as well. So I thought that was a very interesting question and I appreciate that. For me, public art denotes visual art, if we're setting the performance, performing arts aside, in a public setting, meaning a community, as opposed to a gallery or institution where you go into a building, and whether it's free or you pay for it, um, there is an expectation in an enclosed space. Where for me, public art is out in the open, where you can see it, in, as today, in a park or other setting, at the beach, and so on, where you can happen upon it without uh, knowing ahead of time that you're going to run into it. And it's, it's a wonderful invitation 
of a visual opportunity that you hadn't expected to find. For me, it's something that beautifies a space and inspires or provokes thought. Um, it's meant to inspire and lift up um, everything around it, including the architecture, the surrounding areas, because the art's got to fit in the in specific space. It's just not about the piece itself. Um, and the hope is that every person takes something from it, that it enriches your life in some way. So from the government aspect, I would say, when we think about government, it's of the people, by the people, for the people. So I would say the same thing about public art. It is of the people, for the people, by the people, whatever creative uh, genre it may be, whether it's visual, whether it's uh, physical, whether it's performance, it's all of the people, for the people, by the people. Thank you. We can keep that mic down here because I forgot we had two. Well, we were talking about Thank you so much for your beautiful answers, and I agree with that all. Um, so the key in that theme of community engagement and art, I want to ask each of you a question that's a little bit more personal to the work you do starting with you, Georgia. So Georgia, at the Zucare, is it the Zucare? Yeah. Zucare Gallery, you integrated public art into educational programs. Can you share how initiatives like an afternoon of art foster community engagement and enhance student learning? Give a little bit of background about what is an afternoon of art. Yeah, so, um... The Afternoon Art was a collaboration that I did with the Long Island Museum. Um, so one of the biggest challenges that I have in the gallery that I work at is that it's on Stony Brook's campus, so it's very isolated. So we're very community-based on like the campus community, but we're always trying to connect with the community, mem community members. And on the flip side, you know, that might be the case here as well as, um, but at the Long Island Museum, they're always trying to get that segment of the population, like young adults, high school, college kids, and we're like, oh, that's our bread and butter, we have that. Um, so we did a collaboration with the Long Island Museum where we had a shuttle bus from the Zucare Gallery to the Long Island Museum. It was a free event, um, there was like music, and just open for people to um, not have to worry about transportation. Um, so, yeah, again, I think that everything that I do, I really do try to think about, like, how can I expand this to invite more people and um, different people from different backgrounds, different, um, you know, majors or interests, um, and show them that art has something for them, you know, um, and that there's a, you know, a lesson to be learned or just something to take out of that, so I'm always trying to think of you know, new ways to kind of connect people with it. Yeah, thank you so much. And Ron, my next question is for you, Mirrorless to Mirrorless. So you you're um, you lead a local student-led mural project. You actually led multiple of them. And those are, in my opinion, excellent examples of community engagement. So how do these projects engage the community? Like, how do you use these projects to engage the community and boost local involvement? Because, you know, it's always amazing to involve the locals uh, in these types of projects. And what strategies do you use to ensure community participation since your mural programs really lean heavily on that? <laughs> the mural projects that uh, Jay is speaking of uh, occurred at Cedar Beach and Gilbo Beach, two be uh, beaches within the town of Babylon. And uh, the first was Cedar Beach, so it was a new opportunity. The town wanted to integrate high school art students to paint the murals. And we had at first, uh, it's a tunnel going under Ocean Parkway from the marina to the beach, and we did the west side, all concrete. We had it primed by the town. And to get engagement from the high schools, uh, with Baca's coordination, uh, I created an introductory letter, an invitation to each of the art groups at the high schools addressed to the art teachers and with some to the principal because we didn't know the art coordinators at the schools. Inviting for the opportunity to help encourage participation, we provided all the materials. We set up a schedule. Uh, when I delivered the materials to the school, 
I gave the teachers an orientation and different options on the process of how they could prepare. Uh, at Cedar Beach, they were to design two different murals. I gave them the sizes of each mural, and I gave them tag board where they would make full-size templates to create what was going to go on the wall from the designs they created. Because another enticement was because they had a regular school schedule and they had to leave the school for the day, we wanted to paint the murals in one day. So by them having the templates already made at the school, they could come in the morning, trace out whatever objects were going to go on each mural, and then get, the, uh, get to painting. Once I had the designs, I purchased all of the paints and had their setup for each mural in front of their space with a copy of what they were, their design. So everything was good to go. They had all of their paints and the materials, the brushes, the containers to mix and so forth. Because that was such a great success, the first one, the town and the students wanted the other side. So that was, the first was done in the fall, so the next spring we did the other side. And because of that success, at Gilco, they already had murals there that had been done 15, 18 years ago, but um, they had not been sealed and so forth. So there was a lot of environmental damage and degradation, some graffiti and so forth. And chunks of the wall had fallen out, so the town repaired the walls, primed it, and we did the same process. Uh, out of eight uh, schools, high schools in the town, seven participated at each location. Um, it was a great experience, and it really set up an environment for collaboration. I wasn't sure what to expect with each school owning their mural and painting there, comparing themselves to others, it fostered a real community during lunch and so forth. The students were going and complimenting each other's murals. Whoever had designed a mural, it wasn't like their mural. There was a lot of collaboration and teamwork from each school that I noticed. And it was, it, it was really impressive and wonderful. Just on a side note, uh, the, the school murals that I do for an opportunity for enga engagement and education um, the principal and the art teachers decide ahead of time what they want integrated into the mural, theme-wise and character building quotes or words and so forth. And while I'm there painting a mural, the students are watching it in process, which is a great education process for them to see it go from a white wall to the drawing to the painting. And if they are working with me, and I sat with the teacher, each class to come and paint. Uh, the subject matter is coordinated to their age and skill set and level and abilities and so on. Wow, that's amazing. And that is just another way how innovation within the arts can actually connect us. So thank you so much, Bob. So Rachel, how does Spirit Ironworks support visitors and residents through its public art initiatives? Can you share an example of a recent project that was successful when it came to community engagement and support? So recently we worked with Baca on a series of sculptural panels and courtyard fencing adjacent to the Wine Dance uh, Long Island Railroad Station and the Senior Living Center. There was a call for a local artist to put out a design to design the set of panels and fencing. And that drew on the same elements that were within the panels. And the visual, the visual elements within the panels were re, uh, reflected wine damage history and culture of the surrounding area. Um, in addition, there was a piece by Bo Booker of colored glass windows directly next to the park that needed to be taken into consideration as well. So my company, Spirit Ironworks, worked together with the Babylon um, Citizens Council on the Arts the artist, um, Linda Santiago, who designed the sculpture, the development and the landscape architect to adapt the design to fit the space and the construction methods and budget. It was truly a collaborative process with give and take from everyone. Um, we started out using the artist's design set within large rectangular panels of the recommended size provided by the contractor. But after we priced it out, it was pretty obvious that we needed to scale back due to budgetary concerns. So together, using elements from the artist's design, 
we were able to drill down on what was meaningful to the artists and the community. Working as a team um, with all parties, we then incorporated them into a life-size freestanding sculpture. So we dropped the panels away, we reduced the size of it, but we kept the essence of what the idea was. Um, and this, this consisted, I think it was about 24 feet long by eight feet high, eight to 10 feet high. It consisted of eight foot um, bluebird feathers to pay homage to our state bird, as well as Chief Windash, who was the most distinguished of the Montauk um, stage of his tribe. Uh, six foot tall blades of seagrass, scroll, scroll shaped cleft notes to honor Windash's musical heritage, tree branches with sugar maple leaves, and bluebirds, who were the New York State uh, bird. And the original idea had all of these elements. Um, and through multiple meetings, we were able to come together and create something that was colorful and meaningful and beautify a public space and honor the community. So it was a really special project um, because part of, I guess, what we do is we try to bring it all together and make it, make it work. Like that was, I felt, our job during that project. Um, it's very beautiful. How was the community's like feedback towards it? Like, you know, I people go by and they say they really love it, um, and I'm super proud of what we've done. You know, and I'm I'm really honored to work with Baca on the project because they were the ones that facilitated it from the beginning. So it's a really truly a collaborative effort, and the artist was amazing as well. She was wonderful. Well, thank you. That's beautiful. Teamwork makes a dream work, right? <laughs> All right, so yes. in your role with Parks and Recreation and Cultural Affairs, how have public art projects under your leadership enhanced community engagement and well-being? And can you share a successful example from the beautification program? Yes. Um, and some people may not think this is art, but the first thing that comes to my mind in terms of community engagement, if you drive through any hamlet in the town of Babylon, especially in our downtowns, you will see the hometown heroes' banners. And that is probably the, one of the biggest impacts that the beautification program has. Some people think it's the art projects or the art contests. Sometimes people think it's the flowers that get planted. But the artwork that is in the sky, hanging from our decorative lampposts, seems to have the greatest impact on our community because it's not just uh, military personnel who've passed on, it is active military personnel. Um, and when people drive down those downtown, downtowns, there's just a sense of pride. Father's Day is coming up. You may see a lot of people out there taking pictures under the banners of their dad who fought in World War II, or Vietnam, or the Korean War, or the Iraqi War, and uh, maybe away right now. Um, so I think that's probably one of the biggest impacts that we have in the community. Of course, our partnership with Baca, um, the project at Gilgo and Cedar. Um, one of the school districts didn't have busing to get the kids there, but they really wanted to participate. So we reached out to another department that manages our senior buses that you see throughout the town and begged them, um, can you let the school district <laughs> use the bus and have the kids on. Um, of course, there's always liability issues. But uh, we got it taken care of, and the kids were able to participate in that project. It's amazing. And that's just, and I know you said it wasn't hard, but you really are like, spreading history and appreciation. I don't like to call things like that memorial, but more like an appreciation of those Absolutely. who have served our country and just you know been supporting us as Absolutely. human beings. So thank you. So, now we're going to move on to social and environment impact. Like, how does public art address social and environmental issues? So, it's just going to be a group question. Feel free to raise your hand or your mic, and I'll pass this to you. But, public art can address social and environmental issues in powerful ways. Can each of you share an example of how your projects have tackled these things and the impact they had? Anybody want to go first? Yeah, all right. It's coming. Well, I'm not going to speak about the murals, but there was another project. Uh, that I was involved in. I used to work at Colgo Water Hospital on Roosevelt Island. And right now, if you're familiar with the island, at the south end is Four Freedoms Park. It was to be built um, in the 80s, but the recession prevented that. And then they got the funds, 
and created this uh, Four Freedoms Park of FDR. And at the time, there was, I think everybody knows, but if you don't know, FDR was in a wheelchair. And the island was named after him, and Colorado Water Hospitals are two city hospitals that service um, 2,000 patients and residents. And a lot of them are uh, quadriplegics, paraplegics, and in wheelchairs. And the senior center uh, group on the island was very upset that at Four Freedoms Park there was no mention or nothing having to do with FDR being in a wheelchair when this island, some residents who were living at the hospitals uh, eventually went in, back into the community and lived independently with uh, them being in wheelchairs and such. So that was a very important social um, reality for people on the island. So the group came together with some others. I was the liaison for the two hospitals and we put forth and contacted the FDR Foundation, got funding to create a sculpture um, showing FDR in a wheelchair. And the final sculpture design was him in his wheelchair and a young girl, it's from a photo from when he was president, of a young girl on crutches reaching out to shake his hand. And it took four to six years for it to come to completion because of the funding needed and such. But I can tell you that that sculpture is so impactful because people coming onto the island and going to the Four Freedoms Park along the way in this inlet on the pathway is FDR in a wheelchair. And you are reminded of what you could do even if you are living with a disability. And for people living in wheelchairs, to see that acknowledgement in a sculpture permanently in the park uh, just speaks volumes, volumes for that community. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody it, was, it was great to be a part of that <laughs> program. Beautiful. So I was going to say from the environmental impact, um, we did a project um, well, there's always an issue with um, littering. That's just part of the world that we live in. Um, but I noticed that during COVID, there seemed to be an uptick. I don't know if it was just a reaction, um, people's frustrations. Uh, you can pull up to a red light and there's people would literally take a fast food bag full of garbage and just dump it on the ground. And, you know, there were many times I wanted to get out of my car and go knock on the door <laughs> when I thought better of it. And uh, it was just so bad, so I initiated a contest. So I have teenagers, so I learned some of the buzz phrases that are of the day and everything. If something is bad, it's trash. So my kids would say, oh, that's trash. As long as they don't say that about my cooking, I'm okay. That's, that's trash, that's trash. So. I came up with the slogan, littering is trashy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we reached out to uh, the middle schools and elementary schools, and we sponsored a contest. And what we did is we took the winners and we made them into signs and we put them throughout the town of Babylon. As you cruise through, just pay attention a little bit. Um, and we made them into signs that can stand, withstand the, the elements the rain, the snow, the cold, what have you. But it made the kids proud, and the kids love to tell their parents what to do. So if they see their parents littering, they're gonna speak up, you know, and say, Mom, Dad, you know, don't litter. And of course, they'll go to their signs. I've gotten pictures back from parents with the kids underneath their sign, <laughs> their poster that we made into a sign. Um, and we're hoping that it may not cure things right away, but we're hoping with this next generation that it does have an impact, just say, the same way that Earth Day is having an impact on our kids now. Thank you, and I will say that's a big important piece of public art is community ownership. I have like some pretty big murals, and I'm probably very familiar, anybody who has public art, you're all very familiar with this, 
But when you involve the community and you give them ownership, you won't have tags on your murals. You mm -hmm. won't have trash on your murals. Yeah. You won't have anybody um, uh, mess with your sculptures mm -hmm. or anything like that. Like community ownership is very important to public art because that is what will keep the art safe. Because who would want to throw paint on your own uh, painting in your living room? Who would want to, you know, disrespect your own art? Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for that. I just wanted to add and let you know, my brother who lives in Arizona works for the uh, government in the city of Chandler, and he took pictures of the signs you have for littering, the, the, awesome. the reasons and the, and the, mm -hmm. the little awesome. artwork to take back to Chandler. Awesome. So it made an impact beyond our community. Awesome. <laughs> That's it's spreading. So we <laughs> Um, Rachel, Georgia, do you have anything to add before we move into the next segment when it comes to addressing social and environment issues with your work? Um, indirectly, maybe. Uh, so for us, public art was a way to highlight the specific character of a community, um, what, where the pieces are located within. So the town of Hatchup used to be kind of a rundown place when I was younger, you know. And um, basically what happened was, is there was a great um, interest in developing the community, um, bringing, attracting more businesses to the community, I think making it more of a walking center. So we were approached by the village to um, design a series of like metal archways that highlighted walkways from, to and from Main Street. So we, des we designed and built three, we're on our fourth now. And um, each archway incorporates like an aspect of the community. So we have one that's like promenade of the arts, you know. So I, I put like the golden section in there, you know, with the with the uh, perfectly balanced scroll and a paintbrush and some Modrian colors and like we titled it promenade of the arts. I worked with the community development agency in the town, and the board of trustees and also um, Patchogue Arts Council to kind of bring that design to life. And then we did a huge one, um, which is sort of like the entranceway to the village. And it has Janus masks, um, music notes, uh, film strip, uh, sailboat, and it all highlights aspects of the community. So, you know, it's been, it's been really fun. And when you walk into that alleyway, there are murals on either side from other artists mm -hmm. that kind of relate in color and theme to that. So it's really been really special to be able to do something in community that I, you know, I hold close to my heart. Of course, of yeah. course. It's beautiful. Do you have anything for you? Else? Yeah, I'll say it. So um, something that actually came to mind that I haven't thought about in a couple of years, but um, during 2020 and COVID and everything like that, um, and the Black Lives Matter movement, obviously things were very intense. And um, I work on a university campus, so students really needed an outlet. Um, and Stony Brook and I think most institutions were also really struggling with how to respond or what to say or how to deal with the social, um, you know, justice issues and social just unrest of people wanting institutions to respond to, to issues that were happening. So um, something that I did was a student mural, it was like a student digital mural, so I'm not an artist, I don't have the same talents, but what was really amazing about it was that every student could just put whatever they wanted and just turn it into us and we put it out there. So we had students writing poems, um, making music, and, and then doing like traditional art about all sorts of topics that as an institution like Stony Brook wouldn't have let us come out and say things that you know, we wanted to say, so um, a lot of students talked about, obviously, Black Lives Matter, but also, like, trans rights. Um, I had a couple of students who talked about being undocumented and dreamers and immigration and stuff like that. So um, it was really impactful, and I think, especially because it's something that public art does amazingly, is we're all in our kind of, like, bubble. If we're on social media, we probably, like, are kind of in this bubble of social media or just are networks where we don't really talk to random people or hear, you know, um, other people's insights that we might not run into. And public art is kind of like a forum for that. Mm -hmm. That it's like, I mean, it doesn't always work out, obviously, but where it's like, ever, you can say something that you want to say, and you're free to say that. It's not like an institution is going to be like, no, 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 you can't 
mm -hmm. can't put that there, or we can't see that as politician, or this or that, you know. Um, that, so I think that that's really cool and about the shared authority, you know, like people should share authority with, you know, institutions, but also with art. Yeah, and that's one of the things I love about art. As an artist, it's like, mm -hmm. you really can amplify your voices, where I think art historically is used to amplify the voices of folks who are constantly um, marginalized and told to shut up. So it's really nice that you provide that opportunity for the students to be able to express themselves in a very difficult time, because I remember that yes. <laughs> very well, yeah. very, very well. So let's move on to the economic benefits, something that a lot of artists and art leaders aren't comfortable with talking about, but it is important. <laughs> so investing in public arts can, use economic, uh, can yield economic benefits for communities, such as increased tourism and local business growth. How have you seen public art contribute to the economic vitality of your community? And the bigger question, does art always need, does public art always need to be centered around economic growth? Who would like to answer that one first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know this one was <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think it has to be centered around economic growth, but I, growth, but I think by chance it happens to be sometimes. Um, I remember reading not too long ago, as a matter of fact, that the arts add more to the economy than construction, mm -hmm. transportation, and warehousing combined. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that, like, that can't be, you know? <laughs> um, but in reading further, part of it is because if you think about our downtowns, uh, you spoke about Patchogue, um, and you think about, you know, the city, things of that nature, um, it brings the tourism that you spoke about and that equates to dollars contributed to the local economy, the state economy, and, and so forth. Uh, if you think about during COVID, the Great White Way was shut down, so there were no performances. So the hotels, uh, people come from all over the world to visit our Broadway shows. Uh, the performance venues, uh, whether it's at the Tillis Center, at the LIU, or um, Argonne, the theater, or Madison Square Garden, all of those things are part of the arts that contribute to our economy. So I don't think that it has to be the center, but it sure does take center stage. Thank you. Great answer. Anybody else want to give their opinion on the uh, economic vitality or economic benefits that public art has? Sure. Um, so um, I think that a community that invests in art um, shows that they care. They care about the residents. They want people to be engaged in the community. And it also means that the community has put time and effort into what experiences the residents and visitors enjoy. Um, when they, like when you enter a local park, like out here, you know, that's very pleasant, very enjoyable. Or you stroll down Main Street and you see a beautiful sculpture in a, you know, a little area with benches around it. Um, and it also adds interesting character in the somewhat cookie cutter world we live in. You know, like we have endless shopping centers and chain stores on Long Island. So we really need personality. We really need injections of special touches from people, from artists. So, yeah. yeah. I believe that's what makes New York a great state and places like uh, Philadelphia and Los Angeles and Houston and Austin. Like art really does. Yeah. It is. People love to go. They love to see it. They love to be involved in it. And I think when you see a lot of art in places, you know that the people care about that space. Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. Hey, do you want to talk more? Well, just I think art is the heart of the community. Uh, it, it reflects it visually. And when you have that, it enhances the sense of pride and ownership and uh, the community itself, so that you want to do more in that space or you want to go to a place because the art draws you there. Art enhances positive feelings, mood. Blood pressure every you know day. <laughs> and uh, so when you have art destinations, then you're naturally going to spend more time there and uh, spend more money on it. <laughs> so, you know, whether it's to bring something home or to have a good meal or whatever, it, it, it's definitely a big economic driver, uh, I think, anywhere you go. Yeah. And, and Politicians and governments should really learn and own that more. 
we don't be a better yeah. society for <laughs> No, I agree. I do see. I wholeheartedly personally believe that art. Other than the, the town of Baba. Baba no. <laughs> Their types. Art should be seen as infrastructure. <laughs> All right, so last question for the group before we move into a Q&A for the audience. It's about inclusivity. So, innovation and inclusivity are crucial parts, in my opinion, to public art. How can public art initiatives ensure that they are inclusive and diverse, and what innovative approaches have you seen or implemented yourself that have been successful in making sure that these um, initiatives, programs, etc., are inclusive and diverse? I can go first. Um, so I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll just pretend. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, so I think that for me, and I can take credit for this because I learned this in grad school. But um, the one of the most important ways is again like this idea of shared authority, um, and get like also going into a community or group people or whoever you're trying to connect with, um, and seeing what you can do for them. Um, not just what they can do for you. Um, so I think that's that's like a big one. You know, it's not like networking. It's like relationship building and actually um, sharing. You know, kind of in the process, which it sounds like fundamentally um, you all do. But as somebody who works in a gallery, that's not a given. It's actually like the opposite of a given. So um, an exhibition that I worked on recently um, to to do this was is. Um, a reboot on a historic exhibition of black abstract artists in the 60s and 70s, um, and also related to the Africana Studies Department at Stony Brook, um, which I am in no way associated with the Africana Studies Department, um, and did not grow up on Long Island or anything like that. So I'm like, I'm not going to be like, here's what happened about your history, you know? So um, I worked very closely and asked the African Studies Department as much as they wanted to, because I also, you don't want to put like the onus on them, but invited them to contribute in any way that they wanted to, and then also um, worked really closely with um, like student groups and um, Black History Month Planning Committee. Um, and it was probably one of our most successful exhibitions and also like our events were the most highly attended, because it's like, okay, we finally like, made, you know, connected with people and made them feel like, yes, this was it. Like, they're saying people don't throw paint on their work. Like, at our opening reception, everyone was like, oh, yeah, that was my favorite. Or like, oh, see this? Like, that was my idea. And it's like, yes, this is amazing. So, so it yeah, but it's it's hard when you work at a, you know, like a gallery. Yeah, but they keep doing their work. What about you folks? Anybody uh, want to talk about how they uh, include, you know, make sure they're including diversity? Yes. So I'll address the elephant in the room. I am a person of color. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know, um, aside from my official roles and responsibilities, I come with the mindset of being a representative for the underrepresented. Mm -hmm. So it's not about necessarily where people are um, explicitly leaving out others or Maybe they have the mindset of um, you know doing this on purpose. Sometimes they just don't think about it because they're not a part of that life. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have representation so that you have the mindset to reach out to those uh, communities. And what I've done when we have these projects is I will go into the communities. Um, I will go to those local civic groups. I think that's important, having relationships with civic groups. Um, going to those school districts that are predominantly uh, black and brown, for the, in this example, and you know, meeting with the principals, the superintendent, the board, and just trying to get their buy-in to get their kids. And of course, once you have the kids, you have the parents, what have you. So um, I think it's important to just keep that mindset, whether you are a person of color, whether you are, um, this is Pride Month, uh, whether you are part of that community, um, to get into those spaces, and if you're not a part of that community, to reach out to those spaces. You just have to have the mindset to do so. Yeah, yeah. so always remember, keep that in the back of your mind, not be siloed and insular. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, yeah. anyone else before we move on to the Q&A? I think um, for 
any type of uh, inclusivity or asking what is the intention of the art. And hopefully, it will include everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, disability, and such. And for me, when I've done the school murals, um, I've had to think about and discuss with the art teacher, uh, for those students who are on the spectrum, we want them involved. So are there either physical adaptions or extra staff support that's required? And what is it, I spoke about this near the beginning, uh, taking into account their age and their skill set mm -hmm. as to what they can paint on the mural, um, but still give everyone that opportunity. When I was working uh, in another project on Roosevelt Island, an artist from Canada came down. He had done this type of event in Toronto. And he invited the whole community of Roosevelt Island to participate. And this was before it was Four Freedoms Park at the South Tip. It was just open parkland. And he had 100 Civil War type pup tents. And each tent was to include a piece of history about Roosevelt Island. So anyone that participated was able to go into the archives of the New York Times and other periodicals to find out about the history of the island. And then if you had a tent, you visually interpreted that the history. And so I had 20 residents and staff from the hospitals participating, and some of them were in wheelchairs. So accommodations were made, or support was made for them to uh, be included and participate. But So that's just one example of how you can include everyone in the community, irregardless of any of those things I mentioned prior, and still participate in a piece of public art. Yeah, because it goes to accessibility. You know, yeah. art is healing. So yeah. as long as the access is there, let's make it, again, accessible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything, uh, Rachel, did you want to mention anything before we wrap? Wrap up. Everybody spoke very eloquently about this. The only thing I would add is I think it's really important to have a diversity of voices and to really know your community and all aspects of your community. So, you know, that's what that's what we try to draw on, is working with various agencies, various people um, who put together the projects and think about what is important to the community as far as arts and culture. That seems to be where we've sort of lived in that. In that area and, and a bit of history as well but it is super important to make sure everyone has input and everyone has a voice exactly very important to the arts well thank you all for your amazing input today give a round of applause <laughs> So now we'll have just a couple, uh, couple of minutes for some questions. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists today? Feel free to raise your hand. Anybody? Oh, not even you with that hat back there. No questions. <laughs> <laughs> you were so excited. You were so excited. Well, our panelists will be here, I believe, for probably the next 10 to 30 minutes, maybe. So feel free to tap their shoulders and ask your questions to them personally if you want to. And thank you again for being present today and sharing your stories. Thank you.